And after that, he says, after this, he went down to Capernaum with his mother and brothers and his disciples. There they stayed for a few days. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found men selling cattle, sheep and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip of cords and drove all from the temple area, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold the doves, he said, get out of here. How dare you turn my father's house into a market? His disciples remember that it's written, zeal for your house will consume me. Then the Jews demanded of him, what miraculous sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. The Jews replied, it's taken 46 years to build this temple and you're going to raise it up in three days. But the temple he'd spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples record what he said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. Now while he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many people saw the miraculous signs he was doing and believed in his name. But Jesus would not entrust himself to them, for he knew all men. He did not need man's testimony about man, for he knew what was in a man. Dun, dun, dun. It's, a, it's a great passage of scripture, isn't it? And the righteous indignation, or so it seems, uh, that was going on. You know, it's said of King Cyrus, the founder of the Persian Empire, he took uh, one place um, captive and he had the royal prince and his family appear before him. And he said to them, what will you give me if I release you? He said, half my wealth. Very good. And what if I release your children? I'll give you everything I possess. And what if I released your wife? Your majesty replied, I will give you myself. And Cyrus was so impressed by him that they let him go. And when they got home, Cyrus said to his wife, wasn't Cyrus a handsome man? And she said, you know something? I didn't notice. I only had eyes for the person willing to give themselves for me. That's a beautiful picture, isn't it, of worship and of love and devotion and adoration. And in ancient culture, people found a temple to be an appropriate place to express these kinds of emotion in worship to their chosen God. And I think it's hard for us in the Western world, with all the baggage and the, the cultural mindset that we've got, to fully appreciate just how important temples were. Because you see, for us, a, a church building is little more or should only be a, a, a convenient place for us to meet. Of course, it will have some associations for us, some to our personal faith, maybe memories of our family. It's a place where we met Jesus for the first time, maybe. And so it has an important um, association attached to it. And I remember being a pastor of a church that was 150 years old. And they had these pew cushions, you know. And I remember one, one Sunday being horrified because I noticed a, a group of people carrying these, between them, these pew cushions out the door. And I said, what is going on? Someone said, no, no, no don't say anything. They're family pews and uh, these families have been here for 150 years and they take them home and they mend them and bring them back. There's some amazing things in pews, I have to tell you. And I sometimes used to go around and have a look and they had, some of them had these little locking boxes, you know. The amount of novels I found in these boxes. So I used to ask the question, did you enjoy your read on Sunday? Yeah, but, but more importantly, you see, places of worship offer us a, an ambience or an atmosphere that actually aids our worship. But if something should happen to our building, that shouldn't actually affect our faith too much because we would just continue worshipping in another place. We'd go to the school or something like that, wouldn't we? Now, in the ancient world, life was very, very difficult, different because temples as places of worship were so revered that, for example, in the Roman Empire, to, to damage any temple worship, any temple place, actually carried with it a capital offence. And if one was a Jew, then there was an even stronger reason to respect the temple because this is the place where God lived, where God had chosen to meet his people. This was the dwelling place of God on planet earth and you know sometimes we mistakenly in the christian church actually carry that tradition on and we call it this is god's house this is not god's house anymore we are god's dwelling place now mm 
This was the dwelling place of God on planet Earth. And all this for the Jew, it goes back to the Exodus from Egypt. The temple and their worship was a constant reminder of how God had rescued his people, how it appeared, appeared in a pillar of cloud by day, and there was fire in the cloud at night. And that the development of the tabernacle and the Ark of the Covenant, which in fact was just a mobile temple, the presence of God would descend to indicate that God was actually present with his people. That was for their assurance and it was also a warning to their enemies. In Exodus it says, In all the travels of the Israelites, whenever the cloud lifted from above the tabernacle, they would set out. But if the cloud did not lift, they didn't set out until the day it lifted. So the cloud of the Lord was over the tabernacle by day, and fire was in the cloud at night in the sight of all the house of Israel during all of their travels. And as the people went to the temple to worship, they would remember their history lessons. They would remember the scriptures, reminded them how Moses would enter into the presence of God and how he came out and his face shone. I mean, a marvellous thing, isn't it? Do we shine when we come out of worship, I wonder? Reflecting God's glory. And then each year, the Day of Atonement, the high priest would go with the blood of a bull into the tabernacle and he would sprinkle it on the mercy seat on top of the Ark of the Covenant as a sign that God had forgiven the sins of the people. And as time went on, God had allowed the people to settle in the land where Solomon was to build another temple. And that replaced the portable one. Turn with me, if you would, quickly to 2 Chronicles chapter 7. This is beautiful. We, we will actually spend some time looking at Chronicles in the future. But this is just a, a beautiful picture. And I don't know what comes to your mind. I have all sorts of pictures in my mind. But in 2 Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 1, listen to this. I wish we had time to read the whole passage, but it just goes, When Solomon finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offerings and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. If you could just imagine the size of the sacrifices, so many thousands of animals. The priests could not enter the temple of the Lord because the glory of the Lord filled it. And when all the Israelites saw the fire coming down from the glory of the Lord above the temple, they knelt on the pavement with their faces to the ground, and they worshipped and gave thanks to the Lord, saying, He is good. His love endures forever. Now, it wasn't a short meeting, this, because on the 23rd day of the seventh month, he sent the people to their homes. Joyful and glad in heart for the good things the Lord had done for David and Solomon, for all his people Israel. Oh, you know, I wish I was there. They were so filled with the presence of God and being with God's people, they just didn't want to go home. And in the end, the king said, go home. We can't just dwell in that one place, but we have to take it beyond that. And the temple we see here in John 2 had actually been rebuilt and beautified by King Herod and was a place for a focus for worship. The place where God meets his people. And for the devout, there will be a great deal of comfort in these facts. Because you see, it enabled them to see their religion and to contribute financially and, and in a practical way to its maintenance. And here was the focus of worship. Here was the centre of the Jewish community. Now clearly the temple was of great importance to the Jew. But what we discover here in John 2 is that all was not well with the temple. And certainly with Jewish worship in particular. So your first heading, if you want it, is was change was needed. Look at verse 13. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to the temple. In the temple courts, he found men selling cattle, sheep and dove, doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple area, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And to those who sold doves, he said, get out of here. How dare you turn my father's house into a market? So Jesus has gone to the temple for Passover. When he gets there, what does he find? This marketplace going on. Now, we, under, we, ha, we need to understand that what was actually happening here wasn't in itself a bad thing. People came from all over the Roman Empire and the known world to worship in Jerusalem. And when they got there, they needed a sheep, they needed a calf, they, they needed a dove at least to offer, to offer to worship God. 
Now, it took long enough to get to Jerusalem for many of these people. And if you read Psalm 121, for example, it talks about the pilgrim's journey, travelling and looking up, looking up and wondering how he was going to cope with this journey. Imagine having to do with that with all these animals in tow as well. Quite an impossible task. So people brought their money and they bought the animal when they got there. Now, that's sensible, isn't it? And similarly, the law required only the purest silver to be used to pay the temple tax, which was required of every male Jew. So if you were going to make an offering in silver, you had to exchange your money for Tyrian silver, which is the purest kind there was. So these merchants are actually offering a service that is a very important one to those who were devout in their worship of God. There's no hint in the passage that they were acting unethically, although... There's some implication of that in later accounts. The trouble was, not what they were doing. They were just in the wrong place. What should have been the place of prayer had become a market. You see, what had happened was the market used to be across the Kidron Valley near the Mount of Olives. But economic rationalism had set in. Someone had realised that it was much more efficient to set up the stalls in the, market, in, the, in the temple courts, right in the temple precincts. In fact, it was the court of the Gentiles. That way, if someone got there and needed to buy a dove or a sheep or whatever they needed and to change their silver, they could easily buy it without needing to walk all the way across the valley in the heat again. And I suppose it was a bit like the supermarkets, you know, we have a shelf stacked for and then you get to the... You get to the checkout and there's chocolate bars and there's all sorts of things to distract you. There's a cash machine. You know, it's all meant to be sensibly convenient. But the result of this, you see, in the temple area was that the worship of God had been subordinated to the things that were only meant to support it. So that the market had become more important than the prayers of the faithful. And also, here's the important point. They used the court of the Gentiles. Now the Gentiles, the court of the Gentiles is used for proselytes, it was people who were non-Jews who had become followers of Judaism. And this was their place of prayer. So it's a bit like, I suppose, someone moving in a jumbo cell here on a Sunday morning. We wouldn't like it, would we? Imagine now these people. So in actual fact, the whole purpose of the temple to allow people to come to worship, all types of people, was actually being prevented. And this is so current, I think, and it fits the Christian church so well. Because too often the peripheral things that seem very important to us on a personal level actually intrude into true worship. And this doesn't necessarily mean the things that we're physically doing. But it can be the thought patterns that we allow to dominate our thought processes. It can be the attitudes that lead us to discovering, deceiving ourselves, that actually we're more experienced spiritually than we actually are. So many t- people spend so much time in the church and think they're gaining Christian experience, but they're not. You know, I read the story of the two teachers who went for a, a head position, an assistant head's position. One person had eight years' experience, the other had 20. And after interviews, the one who had eight years' experience got the job. Well, the person who had 20 years' experience got really quite upset and wrote a letter to the board and said, how dare you? You know, I've been, I've been around for 20 years and... Uh, you know, this person had been around for eight years. I've got more experience than him. I should have got that job. And the, the board wrote back and said, after they looked at the references and record, their conclusion was that he didn't have that. In fact, he had 20 years' experience. But it was actually one year's experience that he'd repeated 19 times. And we said this before, haven't we, about, about church? So often I've, I've dealt with people who have been few fellows for the last 40 years. But they've gone no further than from the moment they accepted Christ. They don't daily read their Bible to discover what God's will is. They just go through the routines. And back in our text, here it is. The relevance had gone, you see. And the people were stuck in a form that had degenerated over the years. They hadn't even noticed and they thought they were mature because they were doing these things. They were actually representing Judaism. They were actually promoting Judaism. But actually all they were was a, an advert of what happened in the past. And the mess that the temple was in, spiritually speaking, was an absolute scandal. Not only had the religious leaders and the people become lazy and remiss about their responsibilities to God in worship, they were actually bearing false testimony through it. 
And what they were doing over and over again in, in worship wasn't gaining experience of God, but simply repeating that which was convenient and comfortable. So on Mondays we do this, Tuesdays we do that, Wednesdays we do that. And so that's all we do. They don't seem to develop it or grow it. So, for example, Wednesday afternoons we count mother and toddlers, don't we? Great. But we don't just meet with mother and toddlers just to do mother and toddlers, do we? We do it because we actually grow the relationships with these people because we're building a bridge of friendship, hopefully, so these folk will come to faith themselves. There's always an intent that goes beyond the activity that we do, but these folk had lost that. See, historically, other nations respected Israel, and in particular had a very healthy respect for the fact that their God was with them, and their worship had a reputation for being second to none. In fact, when things were, were going right for Israel, they were untouchable. And just a, a cursory reading of the Old Testament, we'll see it was at great cost to their enemies. And the picture that we have here in the text is different. They live on the past memories of their heydays. And a nation was now going through the motions of worship. And that's not to say many people weren't devout. Of course they were. It was just that they had never learned how to contextualize and how to apply their faith in a real and meaningful way. And so in the society, so to the society around them and the nations around them, they just become irrelevant. And can't you see the application there? Back in 2 Chronicles, listen to this. Later he says, But if you turn away, God speaking, and forsake the decrees and commands I've given you and go off and serve other gods and worship them, then I will uproot Israel from my land which I've given them. I will reject this temple I've consecrated for my name. I will make it a byword and an object of ridicule among the peoples. And although this temple is now so imposing, all who pass by will be appalled and say, why has the Lord done such a thing to this land and this people? And people will answer. That's interesting. This is outsiders. They will say, well, because they've forsaken the Lord, the God of their fathers, who brought them out of Egypt, and they've embraced other gods, worshipping, serving them. That's why he has brought this disaster on them. The living relationship with God that we're meant to have, the, the relationship that's meant to grow and develop and make us creative and full of colour, has to be continued. You know, when God provided the manna for the people, they could only collect as much as they could carry and if they carried more, it went off. Because God gives you your daily bread. These folk needed to learn, just as the Christian church needs to learn desperately, that adapting styles and worship styles and communication of the truth to fit present culture doesn't actually mean that we change the tenets of our faith. It means that we have to re-examine just what we believe, how to keep the truth and cut away the extras of tradition and all the nonsense of theological bias and prejudice. We're meant to grow and grow and grow and grow and grow. The temple, you see, needed to be cleansed. And so Jesus makes up a whip of cords and drives out the sheep and cattle. You know, I can remember talking to soldiers about this and they loved this story because he actually got in there and he gave them some. But that's not just what it's about, is it? He knocks over the tables and the money changes. He says, how dare you make my father's house into a marketplace? Now his anger is born out of frustration and disappointment. But the interesting thing is there's grace in that as well. And I suppose that's a, a strange thing to say, but this isn't some outburst of righteous indignation. Jesus is scolding them, but at the same time, he's demonstrating what needs to be done. Their behavior actually deserved judgment, but he gives them this graphic demonstration that the clearing out was needed in a temple, but also in their own lives as well. Sometimes the clearing out in our lives needs to be brutal. There's things that we hold on to and think, oh, just keep that. You know, when was the last time you moved house? You know, and you've got, you, you come across that box that's been in a loss for the last 20 years. And you say, oh, I remember that. You know, and you look at it and you say, you know, and you kept it because it was a good resource, but really you don't need it. But then you say, oh, we'll just keep it a bit longer. I've got boxes full of that sort of junk. So I shouldn't say junk, that's given give in now, haven't I? <laughs> but we've all got, I've got boxes of resources that I'm never going to use, but it might come in handy. <laughs> My father is a, was a cabinet maker. And he used to, every time he found a bit of wood, he said, oh, that'll come in handy. And I, rem <laughs> I, re I remember when, um, 
when my sister went in to help my parents clear the house out because the folks had retired, and the wood was stuck that high. So what's it going to become in handy? Oh, it's a nice bit of wood, that, you know. That's because he's a craftsman and he loves the feel of the wood, you know, and he would smell it. And you could understand it had become part of his life, but sometimes these things that seem all so important have got to go, friends. Sometimes these things we hold on to, and they could be an attitude, they could be a relationship, it could just be a book you've got, it could be anything. <coughs> Something in your life that's holding you back from worshipping God is actually idolatry. And that's how serious it is. Nothing, absolutely nothing should take place of Jesus' position in our life. And unless we learn that, we are not going to grow. We're going to go nowhere. And I'm happy to stay here for the next how many years I've got. And I'll preach that every Sunday. And as long as you keep paying me, I'll keep on doing it. But it's up to you to do something about it. See, Jesus is always practical in his teaching. But that's what relationship's about, isn't it? You know, when I got married, there were things that had to go. Um, in fact, I had three boxes of memorabilia, I suppose you could call it. It was all the stuff I collected in my, in my time in the service. And I even had my old scout scarf and all that sort of stuff. You know, your badges, all that sort of things boys keep, right? I think I must have had a catapult in there. And you know those things you used to put caps in them and throw them up in the air and they go oh, bang oh, on the ground. Oh, oh. I, I, <laughs> yeah, George had one. Yeah, and, and, and you know, I had all that stuff. And my wife, when we first got married, she said, what is this junk? I said, that's not junk, that's my treasure. <laughs> we got it, I got it down to one carrier bag, and I think that's now gone. <laughs> 33 years it took me. Now see, as I said before, let's come back. There's no hint that there's anything wrong with having this market. It's just in the wrong place. It's just that in trying to keep up the form of worship, the intent of worship was lost. They'd done it for all the right reasons, but actually they'd ruined it. And that can happen so easily, can't it? We can be so concerned about the form that we lose sight of the real reason that we're meeting together, and that is to worship God. The Corinthian church, you know, is a brilliant example of this. They were, they were so keen to worship God in the best way they could, but their practice ended up just fracturing the church and breaking it apart. And Paul spends most of his time trying to correct them, and he uses the yes but um, connection. He says, you're doing this all right, but you're wrong there. And when it comes to discuss the, the way they celebrated the Lord's Supper, I'm not going to go into it today, but he says, in the following directives, I have no praise for you, for your meetings do more harm than good. Now that can be applied right away across the board, can't it? You see, the end result of their con concentration on getting the outward things right was not true worship of God at all. Rather, it was the destruction of that worship. And John here in the Gospel speaks about worshipping God. And we'll look at that a little bit further on later on if we get to the woman at the well. Jesus tells her that we don't worship God in some geographical position, but we worship God in spirit and in truth. It is about participating in the divine nature. Worship in truth is bound up with him who is the truth. Jesus, we're told later in the gospel, is the true vine. He's the true shepherd. He is the way, the truth, and the life. So to worship in spirit and in truth is to worship with Jesus at the very center of our being, and the only way to ensure that our worship is not consumed by the outward forms rather than the, the inward intent is to ensure that he remains our focus, not the ways we worship or the aids we worship and the things that we employ to help us. It's in the relationship that we have with the Godhead and the community that we become as a result of that. And these alone will mould a generation for God. So change is needed. Secondly, the new temple is here. And I suppose it seems a bit ironic that those who were so concerned to get their worship right thought they were showing zeal for God's house because actually I turn up from a shift as a priest and I do all the right things and I'm meticulous about it, you know, and, and I, do, I make sure the vessels are clean and I do everything just right because I'm doing it to honour God. There's nothing wrong in the intent there, but actually... They thought that was zeal, but they missed the point. It was actually Jesus whose zeal points them in the right direction. And there's also irony in the scripture that the disciples remembered. You know when it says in verse 17, 
They remembered when they'd been written, zeal for your house will consume me. Now the irony there is in the end, it was Jesus' zeal for the house of God that led to his crucifixion. The only response for those in control could make, they turned around and said, what miraculous sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all of this? Now I think that's a really interesting response because there were laws to deal with someone who came in to interrupt the temp temple. So if Jesus was just a troublemaker, they could have had him carted off. But actually, they're treating him like a prophet. And that's how they respond to him. And all they're saying is, we want a, a sign to prove your prophetic authority. Now what is sad here is that they examine them, him and they don't examine themselves. Their response is just a defense mechanism because they don't want to be under authority, you see. They want to be in authority. And that's a difficulty as well, isn't it? They want to test him rather than to take notice of what he's saying or doing. Now, of course, there's so much, they're not much different from the crowds that we encounter at the end of the passage who believe in Jesus because of the signs he was doing. And there's a danger in looking for signs to prove the trustworthiness of God. And that's why he didn't entrust himself to them, because actually they weren't really looking for Jesus. They were looking for a magician. And I wonder, by way of digression again, have you ever thought about those people who shouted at the crucifixion, show us your God, come down from the cross? You ever wondered about them? What would have happened if he had done? What sort of faith would that have engendered? Now, apart from the fact that we were a failure to complete his work on earth, it would have impressed people for a while, but, you know, it wouldn't have lasted long because they'd demand another sign, and then another sign, and then another one until Jesus became a little bit like a genie in a bottle, incredibly powerful, but at the beck and call of people who said they were his followers. It don't work like that. So why do Christians behave like that? You ever tried to make a deal with God? I know you have. You know that sort of thing? You ask God to give you a sign to tell you'll do a certain thing. And I think we spiritualize it. We call it, I laid a fleece. Oh, you know, oh, do you know, do you know it drives me up the out shop. It really does. Because that's totally out of context. That's not why Gideon laid a fleece. And we're not going to go there. But we tell God so that if you do this, Lord, then I really believe you. And then we use another phrase. I call it the spiritual roofing felt. I felt led. <laughs> How many times have I heard that? Because we treat Jesus like a genie in the bottle, don't we? Because we know what we want to do, but we want to spiritualise it. Or I tell you what we normally do, because I've done it. You go out and you go and do something. And if it works out, you say, praise the Lord, that really worked, didn't you? And if it goes wrong, you say, oh, the devil had a little field there with me. <laughs> Stop kidding yourself. Whether we like it or not, these kinds of demands are nothing more than an attempt just to domesticate God, to control him. And that's exactly what the Jewish leaders are trying to do here. And that's what the crowd would like to do. And that's how too many people define worship. But Jesus does offer them a sign, doesn't he? But the sign he offers is more than just a miracle. It's actually a prophecy of the end of the earthly tem temple. It's a demonstration of the true temple of God that was to come. And it's the overwhelming sign of authority that he was God incarnate. The temple is finished because Jesus has replaced it with the perfect temple. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 10. And verse 19. <coughs> Hebrews 10, verse 19. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, and remember, curtain temple has been rent in two, so the way into the Holy of Holies is now open, by a new and living way, open for us through the curtain that is his body. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience, and having our bodies washed with pure water, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. You know, in John 
chapter 1, and with this I'll close. In verse 14, we, have, we see that the Word became flesh and lived among us. Now, what we've lost in our translations, in our English translation, is the word that is actually used is a very unusual one. It's the word tabernacled. And as soon as we see that word, we are meant to think of the original tabernacle in which God came down to meet his people. Now, Jesus comes as the perfect tabernacle. He comes as the perfect temple in whom we're enabled to meet God personally and so to participate in a divine nature. And all those Old Testament images of the temple as the meeting place between God and his people, as a place where the sins of the people are removed, as the place where the Messiah will appear, all of them find their fulfillment in Jesus Christ. Our worship of him must be pure and focused and nothing, absolutely nothing, not even the most reasonable thing should ever be allowed to intrude. So change is needed. Secondly, the new temple is here. We've simply got to believe. And we'll continue next week. Shall we pray? We thank you, our Father, once again for the gift of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we recognise that for folk who had been living a long time without hearing your voice, folk were doing the best with what they had. But typically human, they've gone in a direction that exalted themselves and not you. And we will confess that we do that as well, even though you do talk to us. Often we make excuses. So often we won't deal with the issues in our lives because one, they can't be seen, and so it suits us. But we thank you that you have a, a love for us that goes beyond measure. And that you have a desire for each of us to to realise that you have come to live with us, not so that we could just pull the cork out and ask you to do the odd job for us, but so that we could follow you in relationship. So teach us this day to worship you in spirit and in truth. And make us whole, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.